$35,000 devices in patients' hearts. And many people think that that's not a good idea and that's kind of the wrong direction for American medicine because these patients have chronic disease that many will succumb to that disease within a number of years after we put the device in. People think that where American medicine should be going and some people's romantic concepts of healthcare reform is that we should go back to the primary care doctor in an environment with a patient that's very low tech and very inexpensive. I think that's dead wrong. I think it ignores what's best in American medicine, which is innovation and imagination. And I think it commits patients to a paternalistic system that doesn't partner with them. And I think it puts them in information purgatory. Further, it ignores one of the most important principles of the last 50 years, Moore's Law. The number of transistors on a chip will double every two years. Moore's Law is about to invade medicine, and Moore's Law has changed our popular culture. Let's take a breakthrough device, the portable tape player, emerging on the scene about 40 years ago. It changed the way we work. My dad used to dictate into this. Uh, it also blurred the lines between work and play. 10 or 15 years later, the Sony Walkman allowed us to take our music with us, freed us from the 16th song album. Then the real iconic breakthrough device, the, the iPod. This device allowed us to get to really become the music consumer, the person buying the music. We could buy music on demand, we could take music where we wanted to, and it stood the record industry on its head, and the consumer started dictating what this industry would do, not a record executive deciding a band was good or some other model. That led to fashion technology, an increasingly empowered entertainment consumer wanting their device to reflect them and their aesthetic sensibility, which led to being a, a real attachment to mobile devices and understanding that we wanted our own customized, our personal entertainment on our mobile devices, which led to portable applications that could meet the many aspects of our life and work and play in a, in a single device. That led to even more personalized apps for things that would truly reflect us in the way that we live and the way that we interact. So devices made us free and it changed our popular culture in a very liberating way. Yet our medical model that people often romanticize harkens back to the time of hypocrisy and has, Hippocrates <laughs> and hasn't changed. <laughs> so, so what is that? That may be a nurturing physician, but I think, and I've done this for 25 years, I think being in a room with a patient that's anxious, that's unclothed, and many don't come with their mothers, and if they do come with their mothers, their mothers are more nervous than they are. And trying to impart some information to them in that very tense environment, and then locking that information up within me, who I'm very difficult to access, and never letting it go anywhere or get vetted or get expressed or, or get further iterated is a big mistake. Let's look at some breakthrough devices in medicine. Let's take the external defibrillator. The external defibrillator emerged about the same time as the portable tape player. One shock delivered through those paddles from a device across a patient's chest when they're having a cardiac arrest changes survival from a dismal 2% to 95% a breakthrough device, an important device, making major changes in, in the way people live when they suffer cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is a major health problem. A half a million Americans a year succumb to cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death. This is the iPod of medicine. This is the implantable defibrillator. I spent 20 years of my career putting these things in. I've helped my researchers work to iterate these devices to make them more sophisticated. They now weigh 80 grams. They're implanted in the heart, they're fully networked, they download information every single day on every aspect of a patient's heart status, and there are 30,000 of these put in the US a month. Why is this an important thing? If you have a cardiac arrest, and the patients I implant these then have a high risk of having a cardiac arrest because their hearts are diseased. If you have a cardiac arrest, and you have one of these things in, six seconds later, your life is saved. You don't have to wait for a bystander to hopefully see you, to hopefully have a defibrillator and defibrillate you. Your survival goes from 2% to 99%. I think that's worth $35,000. My patients think that's worth $35,000. So do their families, and we can iterate this device. We can make this device that has the capability more powerful, uh, meet needs, more customized, and then we can commoditize this device and it will become less expensive. 
Four years ago, I put on a conference at USC called the Body Computing Conference to discuss the meta issues around network medicine or devices in or on the body. People told us, oh, that was an interesting conference. You got a great group of people together, but you know, you're really kind of ahead of your time. You're 10 years, 10 years too early. Two years ago, one year ago, we showed innovative products such as pills that you can ingest that are tracked on a patch that will allow your family, if you're a child diabetic or, or your healthcare provider, to know when you took your pill and how your drugs work. We showed a game using that heart as a patch for teenagers that records your heart rate from your body, sends it to your iPhone, allows you to broadcast your heart rate to all your friends, and introduces physiologic <laughs> functions from a body tattoo, from your body computer, if you're a teenager, into your social play and your social understanding. What does this do? This creates the consumer of the future, the sophisticated healthcare consumer who's gonna partner with their doctor in their healthcare. So we see um, a universe and a healthcare ecosystem in the not too distant future that plays into the other ecosystems that we talked about existing in the popular culture that really liberates healthcare and destigmatizes it and improves our outcomes. I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that technology gets in the way of patient care. I think that technology enables a more compassionate, ongoing relationship with my patients. I also think that the data from these devices, implantable or wearable, are going to allow us to cure disease faster and allow us to recognize great patient outcomes. Look, patients deserve their data. Patients want their data on demand. They're demanding it, and patients should have it. And we're all about giving it to them, and we're all about doing a lot of that work at USC. Thank you.